This playlist collects together and organizes the segments of the lecture on Feinberg's paper on the nature of rights and their significance in ethics. I start off by talking a little bit about Dr. Feinberg. Then I'll turn to his article, starting with his thought experiment, this hypothetical world of nowheresville, where there are no rights, and what he hopes to learn from it. We'll talk about four different conceptions of rights or ways of understanding how rights come about or what they result in. We'll start off by hearkening back to the Hobbesian notion of rights as liberties or freedoms to do or to forbear. Then we'll look at a notion of rights as always correlating with duties, such that to have a duty is to have is to give birth to someone else's right, and to have a right is to impose a duty upon someone else. And then we'll look at the notion that Feinberg himself wants to use to understand the nature of rights. And that's the idea of a right as a claim. And Feinberg is going to distinguish between two general kinds of claims. He'll distinguish with, between them in the article by talking about senses of the term right. So he'll talk about the nominative sense, where the claim is the subject of the sentence. And so nominative sense of claims would be when we have claims, as if we possess them. And he'll contrast that with two different notions or senses of claiming that involve actions or performative uh, behavior on our part. And so I call those acts of claiming. And it's with this notion of claiming, understanding the nominative and the active senses of claiming that Feinberg seeks to define ultimately what he thinks is the basis of rights and then use that to understand the significance of rights and ethics. Finally, Feinberg will then defend his view against a couple of criticisms at the end of the paper, and we'll discuss those as well. So this is Joel Feinberg. He was born in 1926, and he passed away in 2004. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan, and he taught at several very prestigious universities, including doing some time up at UCLA. He eventually became the Regents Professor of Philosophy and Law at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And from the time he was appointed there until his retirement in 1994, he retained that position. In his professional life, he contributed to moral, social, and political philosophy, and published widely on moral issues such as capital punishment, the treatment of the mentally ill, civil disobedience, and environmental ethics. It's worth noting, too, that in addition to being a successful and respected researcher in his field, he was also known as an excellent teacher at the University of Arizona. So Feinberg's going to start his article by engaging in what philosophers like to call a thought experiment. He's trying to imagine what the world would be like under certain conditions. And in doing so, he's hoping to try and understand better the differences between the way the world is and no thought experiment. In particular, he wants to talk about this place he calls Nowheresville. And Nowheresville is characterized specifically by the fact that there are no rights in Nowheresville. And he proposes to elaborate on this notion and to use the contrast between our own world and Nowheresville to help him to articulate and justify a notion of what it is to have a right, and also to understand what it is that makes rights so important in ethics. He's going to try and portray Nowhere's villains as benevolent and dutiful, in fact, more benevolent and dutiful than we are. But he's going to claim that ultimately their world proves morally inferior to ours. And by understanding the differences between Nowhere's villains and ourselves, he hopes that we can understand 
the notion of rights and then recognize and appreciate the significant position of rights in an overall view about the nature of ethics. So in introducing Nowhere's, or duties to Nowheresville, he discusses and rejects what he calls the doctrine of the logical correlativity of rights and duties. And this doctrine essentially um, is associated by him with people like Hobbes and also importantly with people like Kant. And the idea behind the doctrine of the logical correlativity of rights and duties is that all rights that we have arise and then give birth to a corresponding duty on the part of someone else. And likewise, all duties that we have are giving birth to rights had by someone else. And so that for any right, there's a corresponding duty had by someone. And for any duty, there's a corresponding right had by someone. And Feinberg claims that this strong correlativity between rights and duties uh, is an exceptionalist. And he's going to focus specifically on the following. He's going to claim that there seem to be numerous classes of duties, both legal and non-legal, that are not logically correl correlated with the rights of other persons. And this seems to be a consequence of the fact that the word duty has come to be used for any action that is understood to be required. And so Feinberg will give us a number of examples of duties that he thinks people would recognize that don't correspond to uh, the rights of any particular individuals. So, for example, he talks about duties to obey the law. And so he notes that we may have a duty to obey the speed limit, but that duty doesn't correspond to an individual's rights, even the right of society overall. Likewise, we may feel like we have a duty to contribute to charity, but that duty to contribute to charity doesn't necessarily correspond to the rights of any individuals to benefit from our contributions. He'll even point to cases of duties that seem to violate the rights of others. So we can think of cases like this with conflicts of duty, right? So when you go to war, for example, you seem to have a duty to violate the rights of people to their own lives. In short, Feinberg describes Noahsville as a place in which one finds spontaneous benevolence in somewhat larger degree than our actual world, and also the acknowledged existence of duties of obedience, duties of charity, and duties imposed by exacting private consciences, and also, let us suppose, a degree of conscientiousness in respect to those duties, somewhat in excess of what is to be found in our actual world. Additionally, to make sure that those duties can't be understood as engendering rights in Nowheresville, Feinberg is going to specify that Nowheresville is a sovereign right monopoly, so that, as he states it, obligations will not be owed directly to promises, creditors, parents, and the like, but rather to God alone, or to the members of some elite, or to a single sovereign under God. Hence, the rights correlative to obligations that derive from these transactions are all owned by some outside authority. So the idea here is that no one within Nowheresville actually has any rights. There may be rights that are engendered by some duties that are had by Nowheresvillians, but those rights aren't rights had by other people within Nowheresville. So in the next segment, we'll talk about what it is that Feinberg thinks we learn from examining Nowheresville. <laughs>